Well, my birthday gift to myself is to share with you one of my favorite author interviews of the year so far. In May, I had the great privilege of hosting a panel at the Franschhoek Literary Festival with British thriller writer Anne Cleves. And I know many of you have loved her detective novels and you've thoroughly enjoyed the TV series which have been adapted from them, namely Shetland, Vera and The Long Call more recently. Now, those books have sold millions of copies. They've won a string of awards. Anne herself received an OBE last year for her services to reading and libraries. Her latest Vera Stanhope novel, The Rising Tide, came out in March. We're getting a new Matthew Venn later this year called The Raging Storm. So there's a lot to celebrate. It was a full hour-long conversation. We can't play the whole thing for you on air right now, but we're going to play an excerpt for you of some of the things she talked to me about in Franschhoek, starting with the fact that she came to professional writing relatively late in life. I think the writer was always there inside me. I was always more an observer than a participant. So I grew up in the country. My dad was a village school head teacher. There were only 30 kids in the school, 15 infants oh. and 15 juniors. And if you're the teacher's kid in a school like that, you're always going to be a bit of an outsider. Mm. I'm not terribly popular. <laughs> I don't think I can ever be, remember being invited to anybody's house for tea. Oh. Uh, but that made me on the outside looking in and always curious and always listening to conversations and always losing myself in stories, losing myself in books. And then... We moved on and my dad got a bigger teaching job and we moved to North Devon where the Matthew Benn books are set. And suddenly it was as if the sun came out and I was more anonymous and made friends and, and, but still read and read and read and yeah, wrote diary pieces and, but never thought that I'd earn a living as a writer. That was outside my scope and my comprehension. Nobody I knew did anything like that. So I thought I'd probably go into teaching or go into social work and I didn't do either of those things. Ended dropping out of university and ending up cooking in the Bird Observatory in Shetland. But. And I'm sure the psychologist would have a field day with the fact that one of the <laughs> things you did was kill off the cook at the Fair Isle Observatory in one of your books. <laughs> yeah, I did that. I killed off my husband in, a, in my very first book, <laughs> which I wrote living on this tiny nature reserve because I'd met him my husband in in Shetland he'd come to be a visiting bird watcher and then we got married and he got a job looking after this very small nature reserve off the English west coast a tiny tidal island we were the only people living there oh. we lived in an old telegraph house there was no mains water no no mains electricity and that's when I really started writing because if you're not into birds and I'm really not. There wasn't much else to do. And so I, that was, gave me time to write, mm. properly time to write. I had a, I had a little, a baby, a six month old baby, but when she was asleep, I was there and I was writing. And yes, in that first book, I kill off a passionate bird watcher. I think it saved, <laughs> our, I think it saved our marriage. <laughs> Can we just take a moment to recognize writing a book when you had a six-month-old baby at home? I don't know too many of us would have been able to do that. But Anne, why crime fiction in particular? Well, uh, it was always my comfort reading. So if I was feeling miserable or I had the flu or I'd been dumped by a boyfriend, it was traditional crime fiction that I went back to because there is always a resolution. There's always that sense of order restored and that there is some sense of justice in the world and all will be well and all things will be well. Um, but I really thought I was going to write a great literary novel. You know, I thought I was going to explore issues of great moment and social justice. And I'm not bad at writing character. I think I'm okay. I can pull together some, some credible characters, but I am so bad at plotting. You know, you can't just have a load of interesting people in a room talking. Yeah. Something has to happen. And I just got stuck. But when I killed one of them off, I was away. That's what <laughs> I love it. That's where it started. <laughs> Now, I mean, they always say it takes years of hard work to become an overnight success. Uh, but, I mean, in your case, it took decades. And, and what I love about your story is that you had literally been writing and publishing for two decades before the big breakthrough. You'd created the characters. The books were out there. And then in 2006, Raven Black 
just exploded. I mean, I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to it over the years. Why that particular book? What was it about that moment in time that something resonated with it? I mean, do you have an answer as to why all of a sudden Anne Cleaves was a household name? Well, not quite a household name at that point, but certainly was able to give up the day job at that point. And I certainly hadn't for the 20 years before that I'd been published. And I'd just like to say that I think it's luck that I had those 20 years of being published without any pressure. I had to go out and work. So I was meeting people and coming across all sorts of different situations that I might not otherwise have done if all I'd been doing would be a writer and meet publishers and meet other writers. And I think there's a bit of a lesson in that, that you do, you need to bump into the world to have something to write about. Yeah. But then Raven Black, I think, because it's set in Shetland, it was that setting and it was the timing. So it was just at a time when Scandi Noir was quite mm. big. Um, and Shetland is as close to Scandi as you can get, really. It's, it's a long way north. It's on the same line of latitude yeah. as bits of Greenland and Alaska. It's closer to Bergen than to Edinburgh. So I think that setting at a time when people were looking for bleak and dark. And although it's still got that traditional British detective story feel, it has that very Scandi background. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about the transition that the characters make. I mean, firstly, you were writing these books as an author writing fiction. Did you at any point in the writing of the early novels imagine that they might be adapted for TV at one at one point? Absolutely not. I was, well, there's a euphemism within publisher, publishing, which is a mid-list author. Mm -hmm. They don't mean mid-list. They mean you're at the bottom of the heap, <laughs> but they call you a mid-list <laughs> author. And there was no way that anyone, I thought, would ever want to adapt my books for television. Just it never, never even entered, you know, just I, I wasn't even staying in print, you know, I would, I would publish a book, it would get bought mostly by libraries, and then, then it would go out of print. And so the thought that, that anything like this was happening was just incredible. I never thought about it. Uh, so it was the books that I was focusing on. And it was quite by chance that, that Vera first was optioned for television. And that was happened because the first of the Vera books is called The Crow Trap. And it's, it, and it, I can't remember how many books it sold. Very, very few books. Less than a thousand copies of the hardback, I think. Gosh. And then the paperback came out and lots of them ended up in remainder bookshops and charity shops. And one of them ended up in the Oxfam shop in North London in Crouch End. Nothing at all unusual in that. Somebody came in looking for something to take on their holiday. Again, that's not unusual at all. But the person who came in to find it was called Elaine Collins, and she was books executive for ITV Studios. Okay. And they were looking for something to replace um, a, a, a long-standing detective show on a Sunday night, and she really wanted something with a strong female lead. So that's how Vera came on the television. Wow. I know some writers really struggle with the process of handing over control of their work when it comes to, to adaptation because you, you have to have a different set of creative hands guiding it onto television. No matter how involved the original author is, it is a different skill set and a different way of looking at material. I'm not sure how, uh, maybe you want to talk to us a little bit about what level of involvement you've had with the TV adaptations, whether you've been involved in the rewriting or as a producer. Um, so firstly, how, what is that role for you? And secondly, how is that role for you, having at some point to step back and let somebody else take over? Yeah, first of all, I decided once I'd met Elaine, who is such a good reader, and I knew that she'd read the book, so we spent a lot of time talking about the character, so I knew she got the character. Yeah. And after the pilot, I think she took over as producer, so we, we got on so well. And they agreed that they would film where the books were set, and that was incredibly important too. Yeah. Um, and I got to know the lead scriptwriter, so um, I, I did ask that they came up and have a look at my patch at Northumberland before he started writing, and he and Elaine came up. And we wanted them to, my husband and I, wanted them to believe that I was a successful writer. But we had the most clapped out car you can imagine. <laughs> so we hired a car for the, for the couple of days that they were up. 
And we picked them up at Newcastle State Cross Station and we were driving and driving around these twisty little roads. And Elaine Collins gets really travel sick. And my husband had never driven a car like this before. It was a great big form of he was sort of jerking and stalling around these country lanes. And poor Elaine at the end, she said, I'm sorry, you'll have to drop me at a station. I need to go home. I'm going to be ill. I feel very sick. <laughs> but that left Paul, gave Paul and I a chance to really talk, the, the scriptwriter, about the characters and about the place. And, and I absolutely trusted him to make a good job of the script. And I suppose that was all I needed to do, really. Mm-hmm. And the, the rest of the team, you know, I, I have complete creative vision when it comes to writing the books. And I think the film team should have complete creative control when it comes to what they do. I don't know how to make good television, and they very much do. So, yeah, I willingly handed it over and was determined that beyond that I wouldn't meddle. And I've met other authors who've had their stuff adapted, and even if you do meddle, they don't listen. So (laughs) this way I just save myself a lot of angst. And, of course, Brenda Blethyn is, who plays Vera, the actress who plays Vera, is such a, she's a reader too. So we always send her proof copies. She she reads the book. She understands the character, I think, better than anybody. And I sometimes think that I'm learning a bit about the character from her now, just the way she looks and the way she'll, just with the way she stands sometimes. Mm you get a feeling that you know that person a, a little bit better. So I think she's become our Vera now. Is she in your head now as you write the 11th Vera novel? Do you picture Brenda now rather than whoever Vera looked in your head before? I don't, but I do hear her voice when I'm writing dialogue now. Okay. So um, oh. that's, that's how it works. And I think I'm so lucky because having Brenda play her, it's like having a representative on set because... Yeah. Our our Vera is so similar. And if there's a new script writer who will do something that our Vera wouldn't do, Brenda will send the script back and it has to be rewritten. So I don't really need to have any sort of, any sort of veto because she's there doing it for me. Incredible. You mentioned that you were insistent that they should come and see the locations and film on location and that probably might have been more challenging, I would guess, when it got to filming Shetland because the budgets to yeah. take an entire film crew to Shetland on the 14-hour ferry or the chartered flight can't have been fun. Did you have to argue that one with the accountants? I didn't. I don't know whether Elaine, who also produced that, did. But I think, I think they wanted, BBC certainly wanted to prove that they were covering the whole of the UK at that oh. point. And there's nowhere further... In the UK, <laughs> than Shetland. Yeah. But it was, it was, it is, and it is still, they're filming another series of Shetland now. And so they're up in the islands doing the, they do the location shots up in the islands. All the interior shots are done back, back in Glasgow in okay. the studio, but the location shots are up there. And, uh, yeah, because it's not just the, the cast and the crew, it's all the kit, you know, they, they sometimes huge cherry pickers or they need, you know, trucks and, So all that, yeah, all that goes up on the ferry. Let's talk a little bit about plotting. I mean, I know you said earlier you're not good at plotting in the books, but uh, anyone who's read or watched will notice that there are changes between the books and the TV series. And as you said, you were happy to hand over complete creative control to the film team. So that was inevitable, perhaps, that they might change a few things. Sometimes they change quite dramatically. Sometimes they've added new characters, left some out, even changed the identity of the killer. Is that something you're okay with? I mean, do you do you watch that absolutely. and wince, or are you completely at ease with it? No, absolutely. I think once I finish writing a book, it doesn't really belong to me anywhere. You know, you send a book out into the world and everyone who reads it, see it sees it differently because they bring their own creativity and their own imagination and their own prejudice to the book. And so, yeah, nobody, they they... That it's not my book anymore, it's their book, because reading is a much more active pastime than people yeah. think. And handing it over to a director and a scriptwriter and a cast is really just taking that one step further. So I am very happy. 
Let's talk a little bit about violence. Uh, I mean, I know you have very firm views about the amount that is tolerable in your books. I mean, there, there will be a murder, but it, it doesn't happen in graphic detail ever in, in, in any of your books that I've read, certainly. And I'm interested to know whether you had that conversation with the creative team when they were adapted to say you wanted it kept that way or talking about how much license they had to, to use their discretion. Yeah, I think um, I think we had a similar sort of idea about how we wanted the books to go. I don't know if you saw, there was a really great original script by Gabby Chappie in which, uh, for Shetland, in which Tosh, the, the female police officer, is sexually assaulted. And I know they did that with such care and such brilliance they went to speak to survivors of rape and they talked to rape crisis and they asked the women what do you what would you how would you like us to portray this and they said don't show the the assault itself because that will either bring back memories for people who've who've been assaulted or it might titillate certain men uh so you don't see the assault but what you see is a lively, confident young woman becoming none of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think that was so wonderfully and so beautifully done. And I think I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with that. I knew that they were doing it and I read the script before it was filmed and, and tried to make people, people watch it because I thought it was a very important yeah. piece of film. It was beautifully um, acted as well. Yeah. Because we have the same, yeah, beautifully acted by Alison O'Donnell. So I think we had the same sort of ethos anyway. Mm. I'm more, I don't want to write about monsters. I'm much more interested in writing about real people mm. who might be pushed to kill. Yeah. But it's more, it's not so much about the murder. It's exploring those emotions that make us lose control. And we all lose control at times. So it's things like jealousy and envy and resentment that can really eat into a person's soul and stop them functioning and make them unhappy. And, and of course, we don't all kill somebody because we feel like that, but we all have those feelings sometimes. Yeah. That was British crime writer Anne Cleave speaking to me via Zoom at this year's Funchuk Literary Festival. Now, that was a snippet of an hour-long conversation, and she went on to talk about the other writers she admires, about her work promoting reading for well-being, lots more depth of insight into the characters that she creates. So if you are a fan of her work, please go to our website and social media channels. We are uploading the full hour-long version, as well as the shortened edition we've just played for you today. And just a reminder that if you love that kind of conversation, Conversation. I mean, it was such a gift for me to be able to converse with her. Sign up as a member of the Friendship Literary Festival. It only costs 500 Rand, and it'll get you 15% discount on ticket prices next year, plus advanced priority booking, so you can be sure you are in the audience when authors like that are speaking to us. A great, great pleasure to have Anne Cleves, the author of Vera, Shetland, and all of the associated novels and TV 